Hey everyone. So um, my name is Jonathan Whistler. I'm the general manager for Europe and Middle East for SoftLayer. And then I have uh, Aaron with me as well. And he, we're going to talk about what marketers need to know about uh, cloud and big data and how we can help you implement and, and monetize in the, the cloud space. So I'm from Amsterdam and Aaron took me out in London last night. So uh, we had too many drinks. So please save the hard questions for the end. Anyway, I mean, everyone here has probably heard the term cloud computing. And what I want to ask you to do, I'm a bit of a technology geek and I go to quite a bit of shows and I've seen so many times where someone has a very well designed product, they clearly thought through the product design, they did the website design, and then you, you'll read something in a blog and then you'll go to their site and then the site crashes. So for me as a, a person that manages infrastructure as a service and then as a consumer, I think, you know, I wish people would spend as much time thinking about their infrastructure as they would thinking about the design and their product portfolio. I don't think nowadays you need to spend that much time thinking about it, but please spend a little time. I encourage you to make sure that your service works and when you get those spikes in traffic, you're ready for it and you, you don't lose customers. So I'm going to go through what cloud computing is very quickly and how to implement it and then I'll turn it over to Aaron to talk about what his company is doing. So, so cloud is a lot of hype now. So cloud computing, there's the Panasonic cloud, which is to me looks like a telephone, right? Is that a cloud phone or is it just a telephone? Um, what I want to talk about is cloud as an operations model. So in our terms, as an infrastructure company, it's really an operations model. So what it means is you have access to an infinite amount of compute power when you need it, and you can deploy it quickly, and then you only pay for what you use. So gone are the days where you invest a lot in capital trying to guess how much volume you'll get or how much traffic you'll get, and now we're in the time where you can spin up you know, almost infinite amounts of compute power, pay for what you use by the hour or by the month, and then turn it off when you're done. Because as you all know, marketing is a highly seasonal business, so you know, you'll get peaks from the high street retailers in Q4, and then in February it's much lower. And then the other thing we want to take into consideration and, and you want to take into consideration is what we call internet scale. So predictability of load and of traffic and in volume, especially with uh, Twitter and Facebook and other social media uh, outlets, we have a definition called internet scale. So now things can explode quickly, uh, it's unpredictable, and it can be global overnight. So what you want to do is take into consideration to make sure that you have a, a cloud computing platform or a compute platform that you can take advantage of that, right? So if things do go global and they do explode in a matter of minutes or overnight, you can actually hit that demand and reach that demand. And then I, I like to use a little bit of analogy, right? So, you know, the, the cloud as it was, uh, was more like a, a Vespa, right? So I had some, uh, some of my friends went to university in Rome and they said, you know, using a Vespa in Rome was fantastic because the streets were made before the, the cars were built, so the streets were very narrow. Uh, these were a couple of young single guys. They said they were like uh, girl magnets. They would get on the back of the Vespa and ride around with them. So it was very practical, right? And I think that's the definition of people of cloud. It was sort of like the Vespa, right? It, it's not really a fast bike. It was very practical for uh, narrow streets. And it still has a lot of applications, but now we're in the days of this is a cloud today, right? And in our terms, it's a dedicated server. So now you can take Beyonce on a Ducati, right? So you have that power at your, at your control, at your fingertips, and you can get that easily. So that's the new, new cloud. Um, we have some data on that. Some of you people will probably like data. So this shows a performance on a virtual only environment, which I call the Vespa, and the Ducati, right? Which is a dedicated server. It's your server, your network connection. And you can see you know, up to 20 times the performance, especially when you get into more complicated compute, which is required for uh, big data applications. So what we hear a lot from people and customers, and then this is a story that Aaron came to us a while ago, is that they'll, you know, well, you guys didn't start on virtual only, but they reached uh, limits, right? And they needed to scale quickly because their business is growing fast. Uh, they didn't want to invest a lot of time and money in, in hardware and getting the people and training them, but they needed to have performance, right, to make the business profitable. And what happens is a lot of time people will panic or they'll pay a lot of money or they'll just move to a different service. So what we put together, and I recommend if you're looking at any cloud provider, is a, a hybrid model, right? So there's the, the public cloud, which is the Vespa. It's a shared server. It's a shared environment, a shared network, which is good for a lot of things because you can replicate and spin these up quickly. Um, but it also, you won't get the performance you'll get from a bare metal, which is a dedicated server, which means it's your own server and you don't have to share it with anyone else. So it's much higher performance and a much better value for money. 
Uh, the other thing is there's a lot of hosting providers that will give you a, a low cost, but just think about it at your house, right? If you had a very fast computer and a very slow network, then um, it won't work, right? So you'll, you'll be wasting money on a fast server unless you have a, a fast network connection. Uh, and then the other thing, I had a slide earlier that's a global scale, and Aaron can attest this as well, is businesses now can go global, or you, know, you can get feedback from all over the world, and you want to have servers and connectivity as close as possible to the end customer, because now with all the, the mobile and online, people aren't going to wait for your pages to load. So make sure it's connected and it's quick. And then one last thing, and uh, I'll turn it over to Aaron, is you know, we're looking at engineered servers, right? So now we're in the age of big data, and there's more and more applications that make big data easier to manage. So you know, I would also start to look at companies that have an architected uh, data model so you can easily deploy something to uh, build your applications on. And with that, I'll turn it over to Aaron, and uh, he can talk a little bit more about what he's doing in the cloud. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, so I'm Aaron McKee. I'm CTO of a company called Struck. We're in the personalized retargeting space for online advertising and multi-channel advertising. Does anybody not know what personalized retargeting is? Should I go into a bit of that? So I'll assume most of you know that. But here's an interesting illustrative example about why we think personalized retargeting is really quite interesting. All of you will have a slightly different understanding of that, and I think you probably get a lot more out of this conversation is if you and I were to come grab a coffee and actually talk about what your views of this are, what you look to personalized retargeting to solve, and how it operates. But instead, we're doing this one to many type communication, and although I hope you get something out of it, it's admittedly going to be significantly less effective than if we were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Now, what would we get out of that one-on-one -on -one conversation if we were to have it? I'd understand a bit more about what makes you a special individual, what makes your needs special. And what we're trying to do at Strunk is to encapsulate what we would learn in that one-to-one -one dialogue algorithmically into a technology solution that can make those sort of decisions billions of times a day to serve online advertising for your clients, your customers, in the most effective way possible. So we're a multinational company. We have a lot of big brands. Some of them are up here. I'm a geek, not a marketing person, so I won't speak to that in too many details, but you might recognize a few of those brands. So what I'm going to do to illustrate what big data means to us or what the cloud means to us is sort of walk through what we do with big data. And I, I don't really intend this to be a sales presentation, uh, but it, by ne necessity, I have to talk a little bit about what we do. So what we do is we work with clients like Debenhams and Play.com and Topshop and so forth to retarget users who go to their site. As you probably have seen from your own browsing behavior, you might go to a site, but you might actually never have intention to go on and convert. So there's this disparity of value amongst the users that go to a site, and not all of them are worth chasing to the same level of extent. Conversely, you might be able to demonstrate some sort of aspect of behavior that indicates that you know, your credit card is in hand, you're ready to purchase. And if you can identify that, those are the users that you want to effectively target. And what I'm going to try to talk about is what you want to do if you want to try to make that identification, try to optimize towards the conversion funnel, is you want to really look at each individual user in each point in time, in each opportunity to show that user an ad as a, a, I hate this analogy, as a special little snowflake. It's really not about the audience. It's really not about the segment. It's about treating everything as a distinct point in a learning curve that then you can effectively, and in a personalized fashion, retarget against. So big data as a marketing term, I think, is an atrocious word. If you go around here, and to some extent some of the other conferences, everybody's gonna try to sell you big data, and it's, it's essentially meaningless. It tries to make what is essentially a very hard problem seem to be very palatable and very easy, and, and some people really get taken by that. There's no off-the-shelf solution that you can get that will give you big data that will somehow drive business value for you. What I'm gonna to try to communicate to you is, is big data is hard. What big data really allows you to do, insofar as if you can get past the marketing term, is to allow you to make really clever decisions about your users, about your data, about the type of people you want to target, and hopefully, if it's an effective solution, make those decisions really, really fast. Because when you're serving online advertising or you're doing a marketing program, it really is about time. A user who may be in a conversion funnel may only be in that conversion funnel for a matter of minutes. Maybe they're hopping between sites. You got minutes to convert them. Conversely, when you're serving an ad on an online site like The Guardian or whatnot, that inventory is often bought programmatically over a real-time bidded environment. So if you were to go to The Guardian, they're going to send a, a call out to Rubicon or Google or one of the ad inventory providers, and that's going to then go out to 100 companies like us. And we all have a very brief amount of time to respond to that decision and make an advertising choice. Do I want to show this user an ad or not? 
do I want to pay to show this user an ad? How much do I want to pay? And what content do I want to do? You have to do all of that really quick. And a big data solution that, that we leverage, or that you might leverage if you're doing something similar, needs to allow you to do that. So I've largely divided it into being able to make really clever decisions and really fast decisions. And I'm going to talk really briefly about our ecosystem on how we do that insofar as it might be illustrative for you. So this is a typical bid request pipeline. So this is what happens, again, if you go to The Guardian and Struck is given an opportunity to show you an ad. We have about 100 milliseconds to make that decision, but what we actually do is 95% of the time have that decision done in under 25 milliseconds. There's a lot of parallel with high frequency trading from the financial space in advertising. And these are some of the decisions that go through our pipeline, some of the things that if you're thinking about online advertising campaigns, if you're thinking about how to leverage your big data, you might also want to consider. So first of all, we would identify all the campaigns the user is in market for. Maybe you've been to Nike, maybe you've been to Debenhams, maybe you've been to a number of other sites. You might be eligible for multiple advertisements. Which one should you choose? To do that, what we need to do is reconstitute everything we know about that user anonymously, instantaneously, or as near instantaneously as we can do. And we use a technology called MongoDB and Cassandra to do that, which allows us in a real-time fashion to pull out user profiles in about five milliseconds. And that's a very short period of time if you're uh, not used to the sort of the micro millisecond uh, spectrum. Once we've pulled out that user's history, once we've made a decision that it looks like you're eligible for an advertisement from play.com, we then need to look at the inventory that that ad is going to appear on. Maybe it's a porn site. Maybe play doesn't want to be on sort of a porn site. Maybe what we've said is it has a very low brand quality score. So you need to assess the quality of that inventory really fast. And that also has its own technical challenges associated with it because, as you might know, there are a lot of publishers on the internet. I think we see about five million publishers a day come across our ecosystem. So how do you make that decision around it being a safe environment or not really, really fast? The thing you need, what we do personally is, I think this is sort of something special to us to some extent, is we make a probability determination of all the campaigns that user is in market for, all the creatives they could see, which one are they going to respond to the most? Which one has the highest likelihood of them going on and making a conversion, making a purchase on your site? And I won't go into too much detail about with the algorithms that we use. It's things like logistical regression and, and degenerative Bayesian network analyses. But we use a piece of technology called Hive to do a lot of that analysis offline. So I talked earlier about being able to make really fast decisions. So pulling out data from Mongo or Cassandra, for example, is an example of a really fast decision that operates off of many, many terabytes of data. Making really clever decisions would often require offline analytics, being able to understand what is the thing that drives through a conversion funnel? What are the behaviors that derive profitability for your business? And you can do that offline, and we use something from the Hadoop project called Hive that allows us to do this in a parallel, distributed, very performant way. If you're doing any sort of big data solution, if you're trying to analyze your data, things like Hive might be something that your IT people want to look at because it allows you to make these decisions very fast. Now the challenge, and what I said earlier, is there's no off-the-shelf solution to do that. Hive is just a toolkit. What you need to understand before any magic bullet is going to help you out is what are the questions that you want to ask of your data? How do you ask those questions and how do you derive value out of that? And unfortunately, there's no easy answer for that. Every one of you is going to have to solve that problem in a slightly different way. Once we've calculated the probability of a user interacting with your brand and making a purchase or a click, we then go on to price that. We go on to optimize an ad and do various algorithmic things to make sure that's the most effective ad. But I won't go into too much detail unless you guys want me to at the end. So to talk a little bit more about the probability side, because I think this is the part that speaks most to the big data, I'm going to walk you through one of the things which we have found is very useful for us in the online advertising case. So one of our clients is, is Play.com, and Alicia is one of our creative designers who builds ads. She's actually a really big gamer as well. Um, Mostly we had a photo of her, so it made the story a little bit easier, but she is a gamer. So she went to play.com and she looked at Modern Warfare and she might be eligible for seeing ads. There might be some degree of propensity for her to actually convert on that behavior. What we've seen is that we can divide the world into two types of probabilities to determine whether she's likely to actually make a purchase off of your site. And one of these has something to do with the user at a point in time, and the other, thing has, the other side of it has to do with the context at a point in time. So if I see Alicia at 9 a.m. on The Guardian, I might, not make a very, I might not make a purchase decision for that ad, because maybe at 9 a.m. there's a less propensity to convert for Alicia on The Guardian. So being able to look at your data in a multi-factor fashion like that might allow you to make some really clever decisions. And 
what I talk, pull out here, and I won't go into too much detail about it, is just some of the things that we've seen on our site and how you can take a cross-functional analysis of your data to try to derive when is the best time to target a user, what are the best contents to show them. So what we'd see, for example, is on YouTube, which is generally a really good publisher for showing online advertisements, is 9 p.m. on a Tuesday, she'd be 54% more likely to click an ad and go on to make a purchase than at any other randomly chosen time in the day or randomly chosen publisher. That's a quite significant increase in probability. That might mean that you might want to pay more to show that ad to that user. You might want to have a more compelling call to action in that advertisement. Conversely, Gumtree, 5 p.m. on a Friday for a below the fold ad, she's not going to convert. There's a ridiculously low likelihood of her converting. So you might use that to influence your advertising decision as well. In this case, we probably wouldn't have taken that ad impression or we would have priced it very low. You can also look at some of the other factors, and what we'd call these would be contextual factors, things that may or may not have anything specifically to do with Alicia. YouTube is a good publisher. Gumtree is a good publisher sometimes, but maybe not for play. Tuesdays, when it's sunny, whatever those factors are, they're the context of the ad impression, the context of the purchasing decision. And although this applies to us in the online advertising space, I think it really applies to everyone. So for example, we see a lot of people clicking ads during the workday, but they don't generally tend to purchase because it's easy to justify you know, a little bit of uh, sneaky browsing on the web when you're at work. Most people won't pull out the credit card. And that might actually influence on how you build your own site to realize that what you probably have in the middle of the day are, are lookers, not buyers. That could be something that big data analytics could actually tell you about your business, might allow you to more effectively manage your site, change your own messaging on that. But what we found is really important is so you take that context, now you interleave that with what you know about that user's history, what will be the CRM type data. She's seen the same Call of Duty Modern Warfare type game twice over two consecutive days. She's probably significantly more likely to make a purchase on a video game, probably that video game in a really near future. If you can push her over the edge, maybe give her a discount, maybe offer free shipping, she's going to buy. If you've basketed a product, I mean, this is all obvious stuff to people who are in marketing. If you've basketed a product, you're certainly far more likely to click on an ad to buy that product than if you've just been on the homepage. There's a dozen features we could go over. There's tens of thousands, really, that are all very specific. And what we do with this data is we say, Alicia's seen two, product, two of the same products over two consecutive days. She's seen five ads today. She's seen three products on Play.com over 50 pounds. She's done all these things over like 10,000 type of features that we capture. And we're then able to blend that in with the user's context and come up with a very accurate probability of what's going to happen if at this exact point in time, I choose to take an ad, I choose to show her an ad, is she going to click it? And the probabilities generally tend to be very low for an individual ad, but you can separate out individual ads into a massive spectrum of probabilities, and that would allow a company like us and companies like yourselves to very effectively target just those impressions and just those users that are right at the point of converting or clicking an ad to get them onto your site in the most efficient way possible from a marketing spend perspective. And that tends to be a very powerful proposition. And what I generally say, I know this is a bit hyperbolic, but it, the audience area is over. A lot of these companies out there are going to try to sell you demographics and try to sell you audiences. But I think that's largely garbage. Are all 50-year-old men into golf? Maybe, probably not. But what you can do is you can look at the user's behavior and identify what makes them special. And using things like big data and offline analytics and, and real-time targeting, target them based specifically on their history. Analyze what makes them tick. Where are they in the conversion funnel? And treat them as individuals. And I think that's a really powerful proposition and has allowed us to be very competitive in the space on that. And it's important to understand both what context does to the probability of them doing something, as well as the user history that you know about them from your first party CRM type data. I won't go into too much detail about this, but we're publishing a case study, I think, next week with top five UK retailer. Um, this is a bit of a marketing slide, so again, I won't touch in too much. But what we've been able to see in a controlled third party validated experiment is with this type of approach, we're able to deliver significant uptick in overall site revenue. So given a 15K test budget, we increased revenue by 6%. And in the grand scheme of things, 15K is a drop in the bucket for a major top five UK retailer. By taking this nuanced approach, you're able to drive, or where we're able to drive, significant value for the client. And one of the, the things I sort of end this with is if you've seen the movie Moneyball, it's a brilliant movie, certainly to the geeks and certainly to the sports fans. And one of the things that they were able to do, if you haven't seen it, is conventionally up until the mid-90s, there was this belief that if you want to have a winning baseball team, if you want to get to the World Series, you buy the best possible players you can afford, and then magic will happen. So you'd have one or two really good players, you pay them millions and millions a year, and you're going to make it to the World Series. That works if you're the New York Yankees. It doesn't really work if you're the Oakland Athletics. What you want to do is to find a balanced approach 
that uplifts the entire team together. And they actually did quite well with that approach. And I think this has revolutionized the game of baseball since then. What your solution do to do if you're trying to get a data-driven approach to your business is to allow you to ask really tough questions of your data, get really deep levels of insight out of it. Treat marketing and treat advertising as a science. Test hypothesis, put it through rigor. If you're doing things like attributioning for third party affiliates, et cetera, be careful with how you do that attribution. A lot of people do last click. That's probably really quite naive in the grand scheme of things. What are the factors that actually drive revenue on your site? And again, you should look at the factors that really matter to your business, not just vanity metrics. So what we've seen over our history is sometimes clients will talk about, well, the CTR is not as high as I would expect. That I would might say, as a bit of a geek, is a bit of a vanity metric, because you can actually drive conversions very effectively, maybe on, on pretty crappy sites. And I wouldn't say porn or brand unsafe sites, but there's some sites which have a really low CTR, but proportionate to that click-through rate actually drive a significant number of conversions. It might decrease your overall CTR, but it might increase your overall gross sales. That, by any definition, would generally be a winning proposition. So take a nuanced approach. Try to identify what really matters to your business. Is it ROI? Is it brand affinity? What is it? And make sure whatever you do to answer these questions drives towards that business value and not things that are essentially inconsequential.